Hi there, my name is Don Dahlmann and this is Nicole Scott. And in the last episode, uh, we talked about the efficiency of battery electric cars and hydrogen cars. And I also mentioned, I think, in the last series that uh, hydrogen is more about the whole ecosystem. It's not about the hydrogen and the mobility. It's about what can hydrogen power in our future. And if we talk about this, then um, we were jokingly before we started to, to film about trains and boats and planes. And I always have this stupid song in my head when I say <laughs> that. But, Nicole, uh, it's, uh, it's about these, these things. So it really is about this. Ships, trains, trucks, as we'll discuss, we went to Switzerland to see a real world, non-government funded, economically viable business model that runs without government subsidies based on hydrogen trucks, right? So yes. the, like, there are solutions that are here now today that really take into account the fact that yeah, there's cars and this is what everyone sees in the first place, but the business model around larger industry and hydrogen is here today and it's already working. And let's not forget about planes. <laughs> the planes, we will come to that later. But yeah, the business model in Switzerland, I mean, you wouldn't imagine that Switzerland would have like such an interesting and, and fast forwarding hydrogen uh, strategy in place. And it's not coming from, as you said, it's not coming from, it's not stay subsidized. It's, it's helped by the, uh, by the state in a way because... Um, normally, I mean, if you have a running system like the diesel truck system, for example, um, diesel is cheap, um, the trucks can go 2,000 kilometers or something, so they can really do a lot of work. And uh, so that makes it also, of course, very efficient, very cheap. So how do you replace a system that is already like so efficient as it is at the moment? Uh, what the Swiss did was like having kind of road tax. So if you drive, so you pay tax per kilometer, and it's uh, adjusted to the, I think, CO2 emissions also a bit. So what you have is this CO2 emission, uh, this road tax. And this road tax means that suddenly, if you, if you combine everything, diesel trucks and hydrogen trucks are running at the same cost. And we actually sat down with Mark Fremuller when we, we drove to Switzerland in the, in the Hyundai Nexo. Yes. So we had a whole hydrogen road trip yeah. <laughs> all the way from Berlin, I think, what, 13 hours in the car in total, or something car, like that. Yeah, was... And we got to sit down with Mark yeah. and really get a solid explanation of how this business model is working and how the different pieces between the energy manufacturer, between Alpique, who's in Switzerland producing hydrogen, and all of the different trucking companies and grocery stores that are using hydrogen trucks to deliver groceries in Switzerland. And he explained how they created a co-op and how this is a working viable business model. Demand and supply need to match. Now, from, from a trucking perspective, that means that nobody will buy a truck if there's no hydrogen refueling station and nobody will spend the money for a hydrogen refueling station if there's no consumer for hydrogen around, right? So I think it's important for every business case, but in particular ours as well, to bring up the, the infrastructure and, and grow that together with the number of trucks coming into the country. And then by proving that it's going to be viable, um, I mean, financially and economically viable, um, we'll see more and more of these business cases popping up and gets more and more popular and mainstream. I think one of the most asked questions, why does it work in Switzerland and not in other European countries? It will in the future, by the way. But anyhow, um, I think the Swiss business case, especially because um, there's, there's a road tax, which was established about 20 years ago. And um, you're, you do not have to pay this road tax if you're running an emission-free truck. And this is, we're talking about quite some significant money here. We're talking about 60,000 euros roundabout per year per truck. And since we're not selling the vehicles, we're utilizing a pay-per-use model. That means that, that the, uh, in, this, in, this, in this fee per kilometer, everything is included. And I really mean everything except for the driver, but also, I mean, from service and after sales and spare part availability and, and, and insurance and so forth, but also the hydrogen itself. So we're really going down to the cost per kilometer. And we can factor in that this, that this um, tax 
uh, is not to be paid so that the cost per kilometer is the same. And then another advantage beside of this, um, this, this road tax um, exemption is, is higher diesel costs in Switzerland compared to other European countries. So the benchmark we need to meet is higher than in, let's say, Germany or so. Switzerland is like a, a nice, small, small, and, and I'm Canadian, so I mean, it's, it's <laughs> tiny. It, it, it still is such a good example yeah. for how it's working, and it's working today. Exactly. So, I mean, they did it in a bit of a different uh, different way that in Germany, for example, started with their hydrogen uh, revolution. Uh, in Germany, we started with the cars, first the cars, the infrastructure cars. In Switzerland, they started with the trucks. Uh, and then building up the infrastructure around the roads where the trucks are driving, and then actually rolling it out also to the cars. But what you see in the end is that they are connected. So the, the usage of cars, the usage of trucks is connected because you're going to build the infrastructure, the hydrogen infrastructure along the roads, like the main roads, like the highways, et cetera, et cetera, or the interstates. Um, and this is uh, also the way uh, we do it also here in Germany. So um, this is also the autobahn, so where you have all the cars running, of course, also. So suddenly you don't only have an infrastructure for trucks, you only have, uh, also have one for, for, for cars, and I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think that Mark was really able to put this into perspective for me, because I think when a lot of people do the debate of, well, then hydrogen fuel cell only makes sense in trucks, then we shouldn't do it in cars, right? Mm -hmm. And so Mark actually broke down for me how these two are really intertwined in the overall progression of hydrogen yeah. technology within the bigger ecosystem. Because I think that you have to have a larger picture perspective on a lot of these new technologies and not just break it down to one car or a series of cars and one truck. It's really about a bigger picture. Passenger car side and the commercial vehicle side, they, they both need each other. The volume is much higher on passenger car side. So scalability, I think, comes from the passenger car side. But when you look at the infrastructure, as I explained earlier, it's easier to build up the infrastructure if you're going for vehicle segments which with a much higher hydrogen consumption. And that's truck and bus. And uh, they will complement each other and everything that's really heavy, everything that really goes long distances, we can clearly see a fuel cell uh, leading in the future and um, so and we have already uh, our solutions uh, on the road this is part of this strategy to say how we have to move beyond just building cars and, and we see that there is a strong need to innovate in all aspects of mobility so not just passenger cars of course but high performance vehicles motorsport but even then moving out to areas like commercial transport and shipping and the urban air mobility so you know, we're making strategic investments in smaller, fast-moving companies that will help Hyundai become more of a tech company rather than just a car company. You know, we are working with companies and with partners in other areas on EV battery technology, charging infrastructure, as well as producing green hydrogen. And I say that's very much about how we're transforming away from being a car manufacturer to a smart mobility solution provider. When, I, when you see the patent in 19... Uh, 1955, the performance of fuel cell was about one two hundred of today's fuel cell. So at that time, even in 1955, you cannot imagine that fuel cell could be a powertrain for cars because the power it can produce was very low. But today, we have a lot of 100 kilowatt range of fuel cells and we can even make 200 and put lots of stack together to megawatt and gigawatt state scale. So now we have developed the technologies far, so far that we can easily use it in the passenger cars. And we can use it in the trucks and ships. And maybe in some day when we have a more power density, we can even use it in the uh, aircraft. Yeah? So technology is evolving very fast. So it is not, you know, uh, every technology improves faster and faster. So it will not take so long. You can see flying uh, airplanes with uh, fuel cells or big ships. So there's a lot of 
things um, that you need to, where, where we have to think about what kind of energy source do we need to propel them. And we start to use hydrogen. And I find it really interesting that Hyundai is actually making all of these different hydrogen powered vehicles. Yeah. And when we were approached to do the H2U project about kind of what's happening with hydrogen, and you and I had this massive education mm. <laughs> about everything that we've learned, because we thought we were experts before we started. And yeah. actually, <laughs> boy, was no. that wrong. No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but it's, it really is about a holistic ecosystem. Right. And I think that this is what a lot of people are missing when they look at, you know, it's sure it, hydrogen works for more than just cars. Right. But it's about really matching the technology with the right segments of yeah. mobility. And cars are one piece of the puzzle. Exactly. Cars are one piece. And uh, then we have to talk about also about infrastructure. So uh, what how do you power a steel factory? Or, or whatever kind of factory you want to, mm -hmm. want to power. Now you take coal, but you don't want to do that in the future. So what, do you, what are you going to use? And I think it's going to be hydrogen in large parts of it, uh, because it, it does make sense. So for example, uh, for hydrogen, um, or to make hydrogen, you can use so-called electrolyzers, which are, you need solar and water, you put it in, and then they mix it up, and then out comes hydrogen in the end. It's a bit more complicated, of course, but it's, it's, it's in a way like this. So these electrolyzers are stackable, so you can produce a lot of hydrogen with them. So, for example, industrial plants can produce their own hydrogen. They don't have to transport it from this port to the other thing. They can produce it on the place where the factory is. And this is makes hydrogen so versatile in, in, in the usage and, 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 and the use cases. And I love to, to see what's going on there. We, we learned that Vattenfall is building a, uh, or is helping to build a green steel mill in, yeah. in, in Sweden. In Sweden. And, and here you see how versatile hydrogen actually is and where you can use it. And as you said, I think already you can't use uh, batteries in a plane. The batteries are physically too heavy. Yeah. And hydrogen as an energy storage solution yeah. is much lighter. And it really fits in to that type of technology, that type of mobility technology. And I think that we have to start to look at how we're going to transition from traditional CO2 heavy fossil fuels and hydrogen is one of the ways that this, that this will work. And so what I think that people get lost in is the passenger car is the easy consumer accessible device, right? And what we need to do is, is to see that selling more passenger cars increases the number of, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. fuel cells on the road and decreases the cost yeah. because they have a faster turnover. Because if you compare yeah. a truck to a passenger car, I mean, they only refresh their truck lines once every 10 years, 10 years whereas yeah. the, the cars are refreshed now every four to five, yeah. right? So the technology moves much more faster in, in, in passenger and consumer um, vehicles. Yeah. So they need this technology to keep pushing you know, forward and moving forward. Yeah, you need it there, but you also need it like in, in other cases. And and I think technology has to evolve, of course. Uh, it has to get better. As a, again, this is like 10 years behind solar energy, maybe uh, hydrogen. But what it also brings is a lot of opportunities for mm. companies. So, I mean, we see what's happening. Uh, I mean, for example, we heard that BlackRock, this huge investment company, stopped investing in companies that are not CO2 neutral, are not on the way to be CO2 neutral. So there is pressure even in the investment market to do that. And then you have all these new technologies. You have all the new stuff that has to be developed and all the new ideas and business cases. So there is something involving, which is completely new, but it's very interesting because there is a kind of green market around hydrogen. But about this, we're going to talk about in our next episode, because this is about hydrogen and education in a way. So you learn about the whole world and the whole revolution around hydrogen and business cases are very important for it.